was in the room, I, 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 I thought, I'd better, I'd better ask the question. Yes, no, oh no, you're scratching his eyes. Sorry, sorry, you're scratching his eyes. <laughs> anyway, my name's Mike, and I'm a geographer. There you go, I've said it. Um, and I guess when you think about geography, you might be thinking about maps, you might be thinking about uh, capital cities, flags, the longest river in the world. And you might be thinking about your geography teacher, him or her wearing their tweed jackets with the, with the leather kind of elbows, very sharp pencils in their top pockets, carrying an atlas around. And I guess geography is all of those things. And that's the, the difficult thing about geography is that it's actually quite a broad subject. But actually, that's why I think geography, it's about the interaction between the world, the physical world and the physical environment, and human activity. So other than hydrogeologists, I think geography is going to see us through this world 2.0 as a way to look at resources and look at the way we manage those resources efficiently and effectively. And that's what we're going to be talking about uh, today. So, to talk about resources, think about waste. So, there's some waste 2.2 billion tons of it. And that's urban waste. So that's just waste generated in our urban areas. And this is a World Bank number. So, they reckon that by 2020, we'll be generating this amount of waste in urban areas. And that's not including all of the industrial or non urban waste as well. Um, and that's just you know, a number, it's a global number, but of course, geography dictates that that number is going to vary across the world. So the intensity of waste production per person varies quite considerably. Uh, and again, geography is a factor there. Uh, if you take Hong Kong, for example, there's, there's, a, there's an area which is constrained geographically, and traditionally they have put their waste, or solid waste, in landfill sites. But they realise actually there's a limitation to that. So what they're going to do is they set quite ambitious targets to reduce the amount of waste they produce per person by 40% um, by 2020. Um, you've also got um, you know, different types of waste, of course. So this kind of waste could be sent to, most waste is still put in the ground and sent to landfill sites. And the kind of waste that is actually disposed, the majority of that is organic waste, is food waste, uh, is paper waste. Um, and, you know, so the, the, the range of different wastes vary, but the problem with waste data is that it's not very good, because it's really difficult to measure. And so what happens is you've got lots of waste that's possibly going out into the environment, and particularly into the oceans. There's a whole issue with waste, and plastic in particular, that's in the oceans that people don't really know how much is there, and what happens is it breaks down, of course, we don't know what the ultimate impact is going to be. So you've got things like the... Uh, uh, the, the, plastic, the plastic disclosure project, which is trying to map the distribution of plastic that's floating around in the oceans. So waste data is really difficult, it's a really difficult one to measure. But the other side of waste, of course, is resource use. So here we have 868, 8 uh, billion tons of, um, of mineral resources uh, pulled out of the ground in about 1900, up to 68 uh, billion tons uh, up until 2008. So massive growth in the, uh, in the um, extraction of mineral resources from the ground. Uh, and geographers have been looking at that as well. And geography, as well as being a sort of topographic science, you know, has a big element of politics about it. And there's a geographer called Danny Dorbin, uh, who specializes in the, in the geography of equality and sustainability. He sees geography as being the, the sustainability science. Uh, and this was a, an example he gave of the, of the largest container ship ever, ever built. Uh, and this was its journey last year from China to, to Rotterdam. And it had 20,000 containers on this one ship. If you put them in a line on, on lorries, it would, it would cover more than 100 miles of road. So his point being that we cannot continue to consume this level of resources if we are going to look at a a long-term future for the planet. So geography is also political, as well as topographic. But also, you've got to get your geography right as well. And you know, we all misread maps, we all follow our, we all misfollow Google and drive into lakes and all that kind of thing. But at a geopolitical level, uh, this was an example quoted in a in a really good book called Why Geography Matters. And, um, and basically, a, uh, a group of uh, politicians from the island of Mauritius uh, were visiting the US, and they went to see uh, President Nixon. Uh, and Mauritius is a semi-tropical island in the middle of the Indian Ocean. 
and it's a fr it was fr had friendly relations with the USA. But President Nixon was told that there was a uh, the delegation was from Mauritania, which of course is a large arid country in, the, in West Africa, which did not have diplomatic relations with the US at the time. So there was a great mass of confusion uh, when President Nixon was telling the Mauritians that uh, he really wants to re-establish diplomatic relations with, with Mauritius, and, and that the, the Americans had a great deal of experience with dry agriculture. And they were very confused by this, and they then had a tracking, they had a satellite tracking station on the island of Mauritius, which was being run on behalf of the USA, and they were saying to him how, how great it was that they had this satellite tracking station, and this was his response. So, you know, you've got to be careful about some of this stuff. But in terms of geography, I mean, most of, most of the way we experience it, I guess, is through maps. And of course, mankind has been trying to find its place or position its place in the world through maps for a long time. I mean, this is a clay tablet from um, present-day Iraq, south of Iraq, southern Iraq. And it's one of the oldest, or thought to be one of the oldest maps in the world. But of course, they have no means of measurement, so it's all about telling stories. But then obviously over a period of time we, we learned how to measure the Earth, we learned how to measure the planet. But even then, there was still misinterpreted or different ways of interpreting what we were looking at in, in a map. Uh, and this is the Gal Peters projection, fa famously created actually by a Scottish cleric in the 19th century, uh, but then brought to life again in the 1960s by Arno Peters, a, a German filmmaker and, uh, and historian. Basically, the point being that the Mercator projection, the standard map we see of the world, does not do justice to the absolute size, the huge size of Africa as a, as a continent. I mean, and so we see it in a compressed form. So he felt that actually we should be using this kind of projection, which is more of a realistic view of, of, of the world as it really was. Well, of course, what's happened over the last 10 years has been this massive explosion in technology and the, and the way technology has been applied uh, to, to, to mapping and the way we kind of measure the world. Clearly, Google Maps and beyond has just opened that whole world to, to us through our desktops. We've then got the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones as a way to, to measure, uh, measure the world. And obviously, there are military applications that get lots of, uh, lots of attention. But, but these kind of uh, technologies being used for agriculture, for industry, for engineering, there's a massive commercial application for these kind of technologies. Then we've got this explosion in the use of satellites, in, in, in networks of Earth observation satellites uh, that are, that are um, traveling around the globe on a, on a daily basis and getting up-to-date views and images. And then we've got this world of the industrial, of the internet of things as, we, um, as we're hearing about it. And there's a net, you know, networks of connected sensors that are all communicating with each other. There are clear issues there in terms of security of that kind of data, but in an industrial context, these kind of sensors are just starting to be rolled out on a huge basis. And then there's open data, the idea the public bodies are generating lots of data and they're making that data available for you and I to do things with and to learn about, in this case, um, you know, movements of um, Transport for London um, vehicles. Um, so this is, this is this whole kind of um, revolution, revolution in these kind of technologies. And these kind of technologies are being applied to the measurements of waste and emissions and resources. And this is an example from MIT, who basically added sensors to different waste streams in Seattle and then watched where that waste went. So you had plastic waste, you had tin cans, you had uh, food waste, you had electronic waste, you had clocks, watches, phones. And what they were able to do was over a period of time monitor where all those different waste streams were going. Not surprisingly, the electronic waste, cell phones, um, sort of printer cartridges were traveling further. The cans and the kind of smaller sort of like waste streams were staying within the sort of local area. And e-waste or electronic waste, there's been a, a real um, sort of challenge around that uh, because 
traditionally the view of electronic waste was that it was being exported. We were buying this, this equipment, bringing it from the Far East, using it, disposing it, and then it was going back to, we were sending it away to be disposed. So another geographer took publicly available information and he created these maps showing that where this kind of waste was actually being distributed. And this was the traditional view, this was the view in about 20 years ago of what was happening to this waste. So huge movements back towards, uh, back towards Asia where this, where this waste was being uh, broken up and disposed. But then what he was saying, and he's challenged the orthodoxy on this, is that actually now, even though people still think this is happening, based on the publicly available information, actually he does not think that that's happening. He thinks that, that waste is actually not being sent back to the, in, to the same degree, but it's actually being distributed more uh, and, and uh, recycled more locally. So he's challenged the orthodoxy. But he, you know, he's, so he's using geography to make a point. Yeah, but that's not, you know, people are not agreeing with that point because you know, there's other data out there. So you've got MIT again that have been adding uh, more sensors to electronic waste and monitoring where that's going. So they created this interactive map to show where these different waste streams actually leaving the west coast of the USA and are actually going back to Asia for recycling. So you know, even geographers can't agree on what's happening. But what it is doing is it's allowing us to actually see what's going on so we can start to ask some of the questions that perhaps we need to ask about resource use and about resource efficiency. And there's no simple answers to this stuff, as we've just heard, but actually by seeing this data and by understanding the movements of this kind of waste, that it gives us a better chance to make better decisions about how we manage it. So that's a sort of global picture, but what about Scotland? Actually, Scotland, in terms of geography, um, does have quite a strong tradition of, uh, of innovation. And this is John George Bartholomew from the famous mapping company of Bartholomew. Uh, and they created, famously, the Times Atlas of the World. He was the first person to, to create the Times Atlas of the World, which obviously exists to this day. And he was what you might call a geosopher, because he believed, actually, yes, I'm a, I'm a map maker, I'm a geographer, but actually, I think geography is a force for good. And I think we need to think about that. So he was one of the first people to stop, and this was at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century, to think about geography and think about the environment. And to this day, they make the Times Atlas of the World in Bishopriggs, just up the road. And here's another Scottish example. I put this, this is, I take I take this around the world with me, it's great. So McSween Haggis, uh, Scotland's national dish. They think, well, haggis, you know, so what's that going to do with resources and waste? Well, actually, McSween is a food company. They manufacture this stuff. So, of course, they have a whole bunch of different waste streams, plastics, uh, um, uh, food waste itself, cardboard, paper, all manner of different waste streams. So actually they want to manage this stuff and they want to understand what's going on. So what they're doing is they're using geography as a way to try and simplify some of this information in order to, to get a better feel for what's happening. So they're mapping where all their different waste streams are going in order to be able to understand where that, what that waste is and where it's actually going and then also communicate that with third parties because they are always asked about this kind of information. And so what they're able to do with geography is zoom in on a site. So it's all about scale. So they can look at this stuff at a very, very large scale, or they can look at it on a smaller scale. So they can zoom in on individual sites and see what's happening on that site. So for them, using digital mapping and data, it's a way for them to understand what's happening within their company around waste and emissions but then share that information as well with us. So in terms of where all this stuff is going, I, mean, I think there's kind of two, two big things happening or starting to happen, particularly in the industrial world. There's this idea of the circular economy, where rather than making things, using things, throwing things away, we're designing things so that they can actually be reused. And so you get some form of kind of closed loop going on. And so this is actually, this is starting to happen. But I think that the only way that this will happen on a, on a, on a sort of global scale is if we have better information and better data. And I think one of the key things around that is understanding 
the, the distribution of materials, the distribution of waste. Where is waste being generated and where is it being used? And so, uh, so for me, this is one of the areas where I think geography can play a big part in actually driving a more sustainable uh, future. And then the other thing I mentioned is, is the Internet of Things, and this networks of sensors. So again, sensors could be used in the same way, to measure, in this case, gases, industrial gases, and actually look at the distribution of those emissions as well, and bring in other data as well, because geography is not just about a single data source, it's about looking at lots of different sources of data and contextualizing them geospatially. So I think in this world of sensing, I think that will play also a big part in our understanding of waste and emissions. Um, and I can see a situation where you have networks of sensors, both in, in, you know, from drones to satellites to ground-based sensors that are actually giving us much more real-time management information around this kind of, around this kind of processes. Well, of course, what comes with that comes then other problems. And, you know, we've, you know, we've got networks of satellites going up there and observing the Earth so that we can improve, the, improve waste management and emissions management on the Earth. But, of course, those networks of satellites are then generating their own waste in orbit. So, clearly, there's always a compromise to be, uh, to be reached there. Um, if you read one book this Christmas, if you're, if you're asked for the Christmas for a book this year, then I would absolutely highly recommend this one. So, The Prisoners of Geography, and it's all about how physical geography is influencing the decisions that countries make. So it's a really, really fantastic read if you haven't already read it. So to finish off, I'll come back to John George Bartholomew, third generation, cartographer to the king, the turn of the 20th century. Um, and he wrote a speech and it's called Our Attitude to Life, to the World, and to Our Environment. And this was in 1902. And uh, you know, he says many things in that speech, but one of the things he says is that individual effort may secure the surface goal, but a mind cannot be worked without cooperation. And I think for me, geography is about cooperation. It's about working together, it's about taking different sources of information, and it's about synthesizing that to make better decisions. So when I, start, when I was talking about doing this, somebody said to me, but geography is the world, isn't it? And I, you know, and I guess if geography is the world, I guess it can save the world in as much as it can be used as a way to understand resource use, understand waste, and make better decisions about that. Um, and so what I'd like to do is dedicate the speech to all of the geography teachers out there, because geography is great. <laughs>